in that outfit. Okay. okay. So I decided to use, you know, I had that other one up the last time. We're recording. Yeah, the oh. recording just started. I can't get this plant so that you can see it. Do you need to see the plant? No, I don't need to see the plant. Okay. Like that. Oh, that. Yeah, put it on the other side. Mm -hmm. Kucha. Yes. Before I before I tell the story, I am going to do a short little thing because I dedicating it to my grandson. Okay. My intros will be short and sweet. Okay. Well, I guess I should mute myself, huh? Yes, we could. I guess we could both mute ourselves right now. Let me let me check my sound because I'm pretty far away from my uh, laptop. Do you hear me okay? Is this all right? This volume? Elijah, unmute yourself if you're ready. Unmute.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was Brother Elijah Hall. Uh, I want to welcome you all to this first day of Kwanzaa, Umoja. So I say, Habarigani. Umoja, Habarigani. All right, all right. We are celebrating unity today. So important, so important. Unity in our families, unity in our extended families, unities in, in our communities. Just, it is so important. And I want to turn it over to Damana Shaori, who will give you a little breakdown on Kwanzaa and begin with our libation. Absolutely. Akwaba, welcome to our Ashe's annual Kwanzaa celebration. And as we begin all things ceremonial and of importance to us, we ask permission from the ancestors to go on. May I have permission from the elders? Will the ancestors? You have yes. my permission. Thank you. And we begin with a libation. A libation is welcoming all the good in the universe to be with us as we celebrate this holiday, our holiday. And as I pour, I will say Ashe, and you also repeat with me Ashe. We begin with those first ancestors whose names we don't know, who were not unknown to us, who lived back in antiquity, but who laid the foundation for the lives we live today. I pour and say, Ashe. Ashe. We continue with those ancestors who built, a, cre a created and a magnificent civilization on the continent of Africa, much of which was destroyed by those who did not want this brilliance known. But some of those names we do know, and we celebrate them, the legacy they left us. And we say, and poor Ashe, Ashe. 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 to those ancestors who made it, who were forced to travel across the Atlantic Ocean, many of whom decided their death was better than the atrocities that awaited them and they jumped into the Atlantic Ocean where the bones still rest. Those ancestors who continued on, who made it to the new, to America, this place called America, and who also created and built much of what this country is that we know as the United States, built the buildings, laid the foundation, planted, harvested, and created a great civilization for us to continue. I pour and we say, Ashe. Ashe. To those who fought for freedom, even during times of enslavement, those whose names we don't know, like Denmark Vesey and, and Monroe Trotter, we celebrate them because they knew we must fight, we must never stop fighting because freedom, we deserve as much freedom as any other people on the planet. We celebrate them. I say, we pour libation. Ashe. 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 <laughs> to all of those who fought in the civil rights movement for rights that should have been ours anyway, for all of those who told our stories, for all of those ancestors who we know, whose names we know. And if you would like, you may say the names of your ancestors now. We celebrate them, those mamas and babas, those papas, those uh, nannies, those all of those big mamas. Say their Mama names. Johnny. Hello. Mama Lucy. Hello. Uncle Henry. Lillian. Paul Brownlee. Celeste Yarbrough. Spencer Williams. Mary uh, Priest. Mary uh, Williams. Michael Red. Lucy Haley. Mark Red. Mary Haley. David Mullins. Anella Williams. I pour and we say, Ashe. Ashe. And to those of us who continue that legacy, who tell our stories, who tell our history, who make us known, known of people who we have not heard of before, people whose stories have been hidden from us, people who were very important in the history of this country and the history of other civilizations. And to us 
who tell their stories. Ashe. 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 Yes, Ashe. 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 All right. And so we are here to celebrate Kwanzaa today, which is a cultural holiday not tied to any religion, created by Dr. Maulana Karinga in 1967 when he was, uh, he may still be a professor at Long, State, at, uh, Long Beach University in California. Uh, he thought we deserved a holiday that was not celebrated for an individual. It's not a heroic holiday. It's not a religious holiday. It's a cultural holiday. And it's based on an entire way of life called Kawaita that doctrine. And as we know, the number seven is completion in many religious and spiritual traditions. And that number seven was very important for Dr. Um, Karinga. The word Kwanzaa, K-W-A-N-Z-A with one A at the end, actually is translated into first fruits. And it's a, a, um, a time celebrated all over the world where we celebrate the harvest of we celebrate the fruits of our labor, the literal fruits of our labor. And so Dr. Karinga knew that and he wanted to tie that with this celebration. So he added an A. And so the Kwanzaa celebration has two A's at the end of it. So there are seven letters. It spans over seven days beginning today, going through January 1st. There are seven principles, one principle for each day. And there are seven symbols of Kwanzaa, part of your Kwanzaa set. And I will go over those briefly. First, we begin with the Mkeka, the mat. And you may not be able to see this, but it's here. The Mkeka is the mat, which symbolizes the foundation. And everything is built on a foundation, whether you're talking about a building, a nation, or a family. All things that begin have foundations. And then we move to the Kinara, the candle holder. And as you see, it holds seven candles, the Mishuma candles. We have three red, one black, three green. And when we celebrate Kwanzaa, we start with the green candle in the center. And it's based on the flag created by uh, Marcus Garvey, the red standing for our blood, the black for us, and the green for the land. We move on to the Zawadi. When Kwanzaa first began to be celebrated, gifts were given on the last day and they were mainly for the children, homemade gifts preferably, to let children know that yes, your hard work also is being rewarded. We have the Mazal, which are the crops, which is the literal symbol, symbols of our harvest, the things we've grown out of the land with our own hands. And we have corn, the Muhindi corn, is symbolic of life, of productivity. And there is every, you have an ear of corn representing each child in the household. And if there are no children in the household, you have one ear for the possibility of it, for potential. And each ear of corn can feed a village because each kernel is a potential corn plant. So the corn is a symbol of productivity. And finally, we have the Kikombi Cha Umoja, the cup of unity. And way back in the 70s, we used to celebrate Kwanzaa. We would be in a circle and we would have the cup filled with water or something delicious and nutritious. And we would pass, sip and pass the cup around. But we know we don't do that anymore. <laughs> this is a different time. So the, the uh, Kikombi Cha Umoja is simply symbolic of our unity in sharing this tradition. And so we're gonna, this is the first day of Kwanzaa and we're gonna light the first candle and go through the very simple ritual. So please repeat after me as I light the candle. Come on now. Okay, well, you know what? We're going to pretend that that black candle is lit. <laughs> so Umoja. 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 Unity. 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 To strive for. To strive for. for. And, maintain. And, and maintain. And maintain. Unity. 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 In the family. In, In the, the family. family. Community. 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 Nation. 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 And race. And race. And after that candle is lit, it stays lit. And you have talk about what you can do in the coming year to bring that into your life, to be an example of life. 
of that. And so for the, even with little children, they can talk about unity, getting along with their siblings, with their neighbors, with their classmates. So everybody can talk about unity, expanding from the family out into the world. And then we would do all the other candles when the second day is the first inside red candle. Then the third day is the inside green candle and you go back and forth until you light. This is the candle of the last green one is a candle of Imani. So that is our celebration of Kwanzaa. If you don't celebrate it, try anyway. There are many celebrations all over the country. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to get it right. It comes all from your heart. You know that it's an inside job. So welcome again to Ashe's Kwanzaa celebration. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you, you Damana. It's so important that you, you have an understanding of why we continue to celebrate this. But well, we want to move on with uh, our Ashe celebration and the first a welcome to so many people that have just been popping on, but we want to start with a story that has many of the principles in it, and what, but it definitely does have Umoja, told by Stephanie, Dr. Stephanie Davenport. Habari Ghani. It's Kwanzaa time. And this story is about the first principle of Nguza Saba, Yemosha. It is my adaptation of the story, Seven Spools of Thread by Angela Shelf Medeiros. Once there is a village in Ghana, there lived a man and a woman and their sons, not three, not four, not five, but seven sons. Oh, they were handsome. Their skin is dark and smooth as mahogany, and their limbs, ooh, straight and strong as a warrior's spear. But they were a disappointment sometimes, especially after the mother died and the father had to be Baba and Mama for both, for both, for all the seven sons. They were disappointing to her, their father because they argued and they fussed all day long and all night long. Oh, they would fuss about going to work in the family's fields, picking up yams. Woo! The oldest would say, it sure is hot out here. No, it's not. The youngest would say, I feel a cool breeze. Or they would fuss about when they were going to quit work and go back home. Oh, my goodness gracious. Woo, said the second son. I do believe that the sun is setting and the moon is coming up. We need to leave now. Oh, no. We haven't finished. We have to Finish this up, said the fourth son. And on and on they would go until they had to go down, leave the farm, and go back home where the father had prepared a wonderful meal for them. And they walked the quickly, of course, because they were a little hungry. And they walked and they formed a line from the tallest to the smallest, from the oldest to the youngest. When they got in there and they got their bowls of stew together and foo foo, ah, said the oldest, what is this? You gave me less than them. Oh, no, 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 the father. Bobby said, no, I gave everyone the same amount. Hmm. Well, if that's so, said the youngest, I can, I, I, look at this, this is a little tiny bit. I'll never grow eating this little bit. Well, if you don't want it, said the fourth son, he grabbed a piece of meat and said, I'll eat it. Oh, why are you so greedy, said the youngest son. Oh, they went on and on and on until it was dark time. Well, one day the father also died. 
And the next day, the chief called the seven sons to come to the courtyard. So they came walking down in the straight line from the tallest to the shortest, from the oldest to the youngest, until they got to the courtyard and they bowed before the chief and they all sat down. And the chief said, I'm glad you came. I have news for you. Your father has left as an inheritance for all of you, all his land and his possessions. Oh, wow. I know. Well, I should be getting all of it, you know, said the oldest, because I'm the oldest. <laughs> I'm the youngest. I'm going to get it. I'm getting it all. He, when he said, oh, he meant all me, all for me. Ha, huh, said the middle son. I'm his favorite. I've always been his favorite. And they started tussling and pushing and elbowing and rolling around in the dust until the chef, the, the chief said, stop this moment. And they got themselves together and brushed the dust off their clothing. And they sat there, but they eyed each other suspiciously. The chief went on, from this day forward, you may not argue or fuss or fight one another. And I have something for you. And he opened up a basket and there were seven spools, different colors. Come forth. And the oldest came and he gave him a red one. And for the second one, he gave him a green one. And then a blue for the third. And then for the fourth, he gave him a yellow one. And then for the fifth, it was the orange. And for the sixth, the black. And for the youngest, the white. And they took their spools. And your father wants you to take these spools of thread and turn them into gold. And you must do it before the moon rises tonight. And if you cannot do it, or if you fuss and fight, all of your father's land and his possessions will go to the poorest of the village. Now go! You don't have much time. And off they went, hurrying down the path from the oldest to the youngest, from the tallest to the shortest, till they got to their house and they all sat down. It was very strange because there was silence, silence, no sound whatsoever came from the seven brothers. And they just sat, not speaking, not fussing, not fighting. Till the oldest said, you know, what we need to do is to make peace with one another. Let's shake hands and give hugs. And that's what they did, each and every one to the other one. And they said, well, said the fourth son, I don't think that our father would have given us a task to do that was impossible. Hmm, said the fifth son, I agree, totally I agree. Well, what if there's gold in the pools of thread? Ah, and they looked towards the window and the sunlight was coming in. And so each one took their spool and held it up in the sun, light, with the red, you know, and then the orange, and the green, no, nothing, the blue, here, let me, let me look at the yellow, no, and the black, nothing, and the white, nothing. Well, said the fifth son, it was a good idea, brother, it was a good idea. There, there's no gold nuggets in this. Hmm, I know, said the youngest, why don't we just take one spool and just make lots of cloth of it? Well, said the second son, that would be good, except we don't have enough spools of one color. And you know, it would take a lot of spools of one color. Hmm, yeah. So the oldest said, what if, what if we take all of these colors and kind of use all of them? That is such a good idea, said the sixth son, except for the third son well, said, well, I agree it's a good idea, but did you, you know our people are not used to wearing but one color for their clothes. 
Yes, but, said the oldest, what if it was so spectacular that they would want to wear it? Oh, they all said. Well, in that case, said the youngest, we better get started. Yes. And so they went out into the forest and they got some wood and they brought it back and they were just working together and the youngest would hold it together so that all the young older ones could wind that all those sticks together to make a loom. And they began to weave and they began to weave and oh, all those beautiful colors. And some of them had stripes and some of them had stars and even some had figures that looked like birds' wings. Well, when it was all done, they gathered everything up and each one of them had a basket and they put the cloth in all the baskets and they took their baskets, put them on their heads and said, let's go to the market. And off they went, just a walking, kind of fast. The hat baskets were a little heavy, you know, but there they were in a line from the tallest to the shortest, from the oldest to the youngest. And when they got to the marketplace, the oldest said, come, come, come and see the most beautiful material yeah. in the world. Come, come, come look. And people began to gather around. Ooh, one woman said, look at these bright colors. This is gorgeous. Ah, yeah. Oh, I even see a Look at bird's wings in this one, said another woman. Ah, let me see. Oh, yes. Yeah. Then they came silent and they started to move aside as this wonderful, tall, dark man, dressed in splendid robes, came forth off of his horse and through the middle of the crowd. All the crowd knew who he, who he was. He was the king's treasurer. Well, well, let me see what you have here. And they presented the cloth. Let's see that. Oh, <laughs> I think this will make a perfect gift for the king. Is that that right there? Yes, yes, indeed. What's the price, please? I want it all. The oldest said, well, cloth that's fit for a king costs the price that only a king can pay. One bag of gold. Oh, all right. And he got the gold out and spread it out. I gathered it up. I want to take it now. And they put it all together. And he carried it to his horse. And off he went towards the king's palace. Oh, the brothers were so excited. They said, oh, wait, wait, we got to hurry up. We got to get back. The moon might be coming up. Oh, it looks like the moon's, the sun is setting. We know the moon is coming. And so they hurried. Oh, they ran down that path. Oh, they were just rushing. Oh, in a line from the tallest to the smallest, from the oldest to the youngest. Oh, and when they finally got to the chief's courtyard, hello, 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 chief. We have good news. Yes, he came out and he sat on the stool. Yes, what is this news you have? We have turned the seven spools of thread into gold. Look, and they spread the gold out. Ah, very good. But let me ask you something. Have you fussed? Have you fought with one another? Oh, no, said the youngest. We were too busy working together. Mm -mm. Well, then, <laughs> you have finally absolutely understood the lesson your father wanted to teach you. So, his land and his possessions are all yours. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes. But everyone was happy except for the youngest son. He looked so sad. What is it, my brother, said the oldest. Well, we have an inheritance, but the poor people of our village, they do not have anything like this. Hmm. That's very true. Said the second son, what if we teach everyone in the village how to make this cloth and they too would be able to prosper? Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. The chief said, well, you have really learned a lesson for your father. And off they went down that road from the tallest to the smallest, from the oldest to the youngest. And they got into that house and they began to plan and many months later, 
everyone in the village had learned how to weave this marvelous cloth. And they continued to do that ever since. And the seven sons never fussed, worked perfectly in the land on the farm. Now you may think that this is just a story, but I want to tell you that I have visited that village. It's called Kamasi and is in Ghana. And they wove together something we call kinti cloth. Now I know back then it was for royalty. The kings and queens would toss, especially the kings, over a piece of cloth over their shoulders. Some yeah. bound it around their waist. But as time went on, those of us who are of African descent said, hey, we have a royalty too. And so they began to wear it also. This story, The Seven Spools of Thread, is about the first principle of Nguza Saba called Umoja. So everyone, have a happy Kwanzaa. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now we want to move on to our next teller. Our next teller is named, we call her Serenity, because she loves to tell those type of stories that just make you feel good. <laughs> this story she's telling today is a personal story. And I love the title because she calls it Blacknificence. And I said, well, let me just shut up and listen. <laughs> Please welcome, and if you're not muted, and you're not telling right now, please mute yourself because we get a lot of knocking when you don't. But Pat, Serenity, please unmute yourself so that we can all hear you. Thank you, Kucha. Good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to dedicate this story to my grandson because he is the reason why I wrote it. He gave me this idea. I dare you, I double D dare you to do something magnificent. Magnificent? Blacknificent is three times that of magnificence. I wish that I could say that I coined that term. I didn't. I heard it not too long ago on a radio station called WVON. If you don't listen to WVON, I, I invite you to do so. They're always talking about Black excellence. And so when that term came up, it was something that I said, hmm, I'll have to use that. I could share with you some ways that I've exhibited Black magnificence in my lifetime, but this story is not about me. It's about a man whose nickname was Box. His name was Henry Brown, but they gave him that nickname and, and you'll see why. Now in 1815 or 1816, they're not sure what year Henry was born. He was born an enslaved child in Virginia. But whatever year he was born, he was destined to do great things. Tired of seeing auction blocks. Tired of seeing whipping post. Tired of hearing that families were being separated, his included, his wife and children, and tired of the unjust laws that were coded as black codes. 
an example of a Black code was that not more than five Black people could gather in one spot at one time. Some of us have more than five people in our nuclear families. Wasn't that crazy? Henry was sick of it. So at the age of 33, he did the Jesus thing. 33 is considered the Jesus year because that man performed the greatest miracle of all. He died and rose from the dead amongst other things. There are some people who feel that when they turn 33, it's time for them to do something important, whether it be for themselves or for mankind. Well, for Henry, it was his year to be free. You see, Henry, he, he, he craved freedom. He thirsted for freedom. He desired freedom. And whatever it took, he was going to make that happen. This is where he is black -nificent. You see, this man conceptualized seeing himself being shipped inside of a box to another state to escape the bondages of slavery. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I used to play inside of a box. When you're in there, you're scrunched in and there's no room for movement. Well, somehow Henry decided that this was going to be his ticket to freedom. There are some who say he actually heard a voice telling him to do that and told him exactly how it should be done. But however it was done, there was no way he could do it by himself. He had to trust somebody. He trusted two somebodies, a free man named James Caesar Anthony Smith. What a great name. And believe it or not, a white slave owner by the name of Samuel Smith. Uh, they weren't related. They just happen to have the same last name. Now, Samuel, he wrote a letter and sent it ahead of time to somebody that he knew in Philadelphia. And that person that he knew happened to be an abolitionist. But on top of that, he was one of the leaders in the Philadelphia Anti-Slavery Society. It's good to have connections, isn't it? Well, in the meantime, the Smith brothers back in Virginia, they helped Henry fit inside of that box. Now that box was only about three feet wide, two and a half feet deep and two feet long. Henry was squeezed inside of that box. They put some stuffing in there just enough to give him a little cushion, but not enough to suffocate him. And they gave him a, a little bit of thing of water so that he could quench his thirst. Now, need I remind you that when packages are being shipped, they get tossed around, banged around, thrown around, sometimes busted open, even though they're marked fragile and handle with care. Henry's box was labeled dry goods and this side up. The Smiths made sure that he was in there tight. And once he was in there, they nailed that box shut. There was no way he was getting out of there. Henry's box went by wagon, by train, 
by steamboat, by ferries, and more wagons. But I tell you, on March 23rd, 27 hours later, that's more than a day, his box finally reached the Philadelphia headquarters. And when James McKim was getting ready to open that box, he did so with fear and trepidation because he had no idea about what he was going to find. In his mind, who in the world would survive such an ordeal? Yet, when he opened that box, Henry jumped up and he did the Jesus thing again. It looked as if he was rising from the dead. If you could have seen the faces on Jim McKim and all those that were with him, they were full of shock because when Henry emerged out of that box, he was singing. I just want to thank you forever and ever and ever for what you've done for me. Blessing and honor and glory. <laughs> they probably wanted to sing along right with him, but they were just too much in a state of shock. Henry, he may have been an enslaved man from Virginia, but now he was free. Henry use the rest of his life to make sure people, no matter where they were, whoever was in the, within the sound of his voice, he wanted them to hear what it was like to have been enslaved and what people were experiencing still that day. Henry, he reinvented himself many times over during his Freeman years. Whether he was Henry Box Brown, the abolitionist, or Henry, the African prince, you know, he did some acting. He was acting out all of what had happened to him. Or whether he was Henry, the magician, king of all mesmerizers. You know, he was inside of that crate and would appear and disappear. Or whether he was Henry Professor Box Brown. He made it his life's mission to teach and preach and encourage people to fight against slavery. He was determined to make sure that his message was heard. He even created a moving panorama that showed what happened from beginning to end. And every time he talked about his experience, he always had that original box where he would crawl in and crawl right out singing. Henry died in 1875 but he became a symbol of the Underground Railroad because he helped many escape in the same way that he did. Now, some didn't make it, but that's okay because nothing beats a failure but a try. What Henry did then and what we know now is that if you practice self-determination, what we call kuchichakalia, anything can happen. They say that if you say a person's name, they will never be forgotten. And so I'm going to invite you on the count of three to unmute yourselves and say Henry Box Brown with me three times. One, two, three. 
Henry Bob Brown. Henry Bob Brown. Henry Bob Brown. Thank you. Henry will never be forgotten. Stop moving. I dare you. I double D dare you to do something magnificent. And as a friend always says, that's it. That's all. All right, all right. That is it. That's all. But you gave us a job. Do something magnificent. Okay. Our next tellers, we're going to have a tandem tell here. It's a sister and brother, Kalila and Malik Muhammad. Kalila has been with us some time. She's what we call a, one of our veterans, but Malik is just joining the storytelling game. And we are excited to hear them tell, not my problem. Unmute yourself. My name is Khalila Muhammad. And my name is Abdul Malik Muhammad. Habari Ghani. Umoja Habari Ghani. Umoja is the first principal of Kwanzaa, which is what we're celebrating today. But the story we're going to tell is based off of a different principle. And we want you to guess what it is after we tell the story. We're going to be telling a story that's called Not Our Problem by Margaret Reed MacDonald. Once there was a king sitting with his advisor in the palace. They were eating honey on fluffed rice. When a drop of honey fell onto the windowsill. Your Majesty, a drop of honey has fallen onto the windowsill. Don't worry, it is not our problem. Okay. Then a gecko came and began to eat the drop of honey. Your Majesty, a gecko is eating the drop of honey. Never mind, that is not our problem. Okay. A cat saw the gecko eating the honey and then the cat began to eat the gecko. Your Majesty, a cat is eating the gecko that was eating the honey. Never mind, that is not our problem. Okay. Then a dog came and saw the cat and began to chase it everywhere. And they started fighting. Your Majesty, a cat and dog are fighting underneath the palace window. Never mind, that is not our problem. The cat's owner saw the dog fighting with her cat and she began to beat the dog. Then the dog's owner saw the woman beating his dog and began to beat the woman. Your Majesty, the owner of the cat and dog are fighting underneath the palace. We have to send somebody to stop the fight. Never mind, that is not our problem. Then some soldiers came and saw the man and the woman fighting. And then they were going to break the fight up, but they heard the story and they heard the woman's side and the man's side. So some of those soldiers sided with the woman and the other soldiers sided with the man. And they all began to fight. And then a civil war broke out and the palace was burned to the ashes. And the king and his advisor stood in the ashes. Well, maybe it was our problem. The end. Next, we're going to be doing a song called The Perpetual Motion of Kwanzaa on cello and violin. I'm going to be playing the cello and Abdul Malik is going to be playing the violin. Wonderful. Now, are we? Did you still want us to guess what principle that story in, was about? Yes. Does anybody have a 
A guess? Unmute yourself and say it. No one? I think I know, but I got inside knowledge. <laughs> oh, well, you want going once, going twice? You want to tell them? Yes. This story is about Ujima, which is collective work and responsibility. Because it is our problem. Don't sit back watching things happen and say, it's not my problem. It is part of our responsibility. Thank you so much. And now, music. the music. Come on, <laughs> It was a great first telling. Everyone, this is Malik's first telling, and we are so proud of him. And of course, everybody knows we love Kalila. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, Brother Elijah Hall is going to do to share with us a poem that he has written. And uh Right, Elijah? Yes. Yay, okay. Yay, okay. This is a personal, he, he's written and he's going to do it for us right now. This piece is called Young, Black, and Gifted. A magic. Can you turn up your audio because we can barely hear you? <laughs> Okay, we'll do. I'm magical with my melanin. It's my cloak. Keeps me young, black, and gifted like Nina wrote. So I know how to be free like Nina spoke. Be phenomenal like Maya Angelou. Black and gifted, lifted, spiritual. Orisha's in my veins, kind of like Kiriku. When we're feeling good, look inside of you. And there's no fear anywhere to find in you. Reconnect and heal, and we can be the miracle. Power individuals made in the mirror. Their wisdom is in our blood and it never disappears. 5,000 years, a whole trail of tears. You feel like giving up, but the ancestors here. So keep your prayers up and your African spears. 
Keep your prayers up and your African spears. Keep your prayers up and your African spears. Keep your prayers up and your African spears. Still black and gifted. Still black and gifted. I'm magical with my melanin because it's my cloak. It keeps me young, black, and gifted like Nina Rose. So I know how to be free like Nina spoke. Be phenomenal like Maya Angelou. Chicago policy kings. Meet the legacy that black Chicago brings. Meet the cultural pleasantries that Chicago means. Do Sabo is Chicago. Do Sabo is Chicago. Do Sabo is Chicago. So let it ring in our stories. Let it move in our feet. Let it sing what's what's foreseen. Let it groove in our beat. 5,000 years. You feel like giving up, but the ancestors here. You Feel like giving up so the ancestors here, so keep your prayers up and your African spears. Keep your prayers up and your African spears. Keep your prayers up and your African spears. Keep your prayers up, cause we Africans. That's that piece. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. And I want you all to know that that poem will be released on sound clock in a few days on Elijah's birthday. So uh, I'm, I was loving it without music. I can't wait to hear it with music behind it. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you. You know, our Kumba creativity is, is so important because it, I, it is the mother of invention and is also the sixth principle, I'm just saying. But next, we have your son, Amin Hall, doing a story he wrote called Animal Kingdom. Hi, my name is Amin. My story is called Animal Kingdom. Once upon a time, in the kingdom of animals, there was this tiger named Tomo who wanted stripes of a tiger. So he ran to the king asking, how do I get my stripes? The king said, you need to complete two tasks. Tomo said, what type of task? The king said, the first one is hunting down a deer, hunting down a deer. The second one is having to sneak in a human's house and steal a book. Tomo was hyped, so he got on the road. When he left, the king said, I have faith in that little boy. So when Tomo got on the road, he saw this rabbit. Tomo asked, have you seen a deer? The rabbit said, yes. She just passed by. The rabbit said, the, Tomo said, how can I trust you? The rabbit said, just have faith in me. So he followed the, the directions to get to the deer. A few moments later, he saw the deer. He could not believe his eyes. So he started sneaking up on the deer and then boom, he pounced out of the ground and caught it. So he went to he went to do the second task. One day later, he saw this owl on the road. He asked, have you seen the house? The owl said, yes, just keep going straight and then turn. Tomo asked, how can I trust you? The owl said, just have faith in me. Tomo followed the directions and arrived at the house. He went in because there was no humans when he opened the door. He ran to the shelf and took one. One of the books he started wanting to the king. He got one of the books he started wanting to get to the king. The king said, did you complete the task? Tomo said yes and gave the king the things. So the king said, I have now blessed you with tiger stripes. The end. This shows Imani because the animals he met said to have faith in them, and he did. Um, Imani, how Imani is in my life is because I have to have faith to, um, like, do tests and, like, to do projects, and, yeah.
Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, is new to our Ashe youth group and he likes writing his own stories, which I love. I'm, I'm, I, I'm so happy that he picked faith because uh, one thing about Kwanzaa, we start today and each day we take another principle and we deal with it and we think about it and we talk about it and what can we do with it and we deal with these seven principles till the last day of Kwanzaa, the seventh day, which is the first day of the new year, it is faith. It is Imani, and we step out on faith to do whatever it is we have been talking about doing for this week. We're gonna bring back Kalila and Malik because they have a little uh, up-tempo piece for us called, it's Kwanzaa time, we ready? Kalila and Malik. Ready? 
going to say something else, Kalila? No, that was fabulous. You made me want to jump up and dance with you. <laughs> I was... <laughs> and Malik, I know you're ready. I can't wait to see the next thing. So everyone, give our tellers a big round of applause. <laughs> Wave your hands, unmute yourself, and make some noise. Woo! All right, all right. Hey, hey. Everybody. <laughs> yeah, we're ready. All right. Crimes to go ahead, don't we? It's crimes time. We ready. We crimes time. We ready. children come together to celebrate our unity. That's why it's the first day, because the first principle is unity. And if we get that, all right, everything else can fall in line. If you don't celebrate Kwanzaa, consider celebrating it this year. You had your, you had your start today. I'm so glad to see the people I haven't seen in a while, Brother Mondrea. Good to see you. And thank you, Damana, for always keeping us on point and knowing everything. I see Donna Montgomery. I see you, Sandra Brown, Joyce Butler. Who else have we got here? Okay, Pat, I got Emily. Woo -woo. So glad you can make it. Lawson. Alice. Alice Collins. Keeper, fire keeper, uh, Kanisha, Jindal, Lise, Gwen, Garrett, and I see. Thank you for coming. Continue to celebrate this day. Smile at somebody. Uplift them by letting them know that today is Moja. Amarigani. Moja. Goodbye, everybody. Hi, Pat. <laughs> Hi, cousin. Hi, cousin. <laughs> I'm going to call you. All right. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs>